Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as mother and father in Jesus Christ who alone and always is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning Redeemer. Let me share with you that I am excited, humbled, and grateful for the opportunity to share what will prayerfully be a powerful and yet not too long of a word from the Lord today as we continue on in our series. Won't you bow with me in prayer as we prepare our hearts, our minds, our lives to be the fertile soil to receive the seed of the Word of God. Lord, I thank you today for the power of your spoken word. That You stepped into nothingness and said, let there be and everything had to be. We thank you for the gift of our holy and written word, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We thank you for the living word, the incarnate word of Jesus Christ, as we seek to mimic and model him in our daily living, and we align ourselves with the essence of your word. I impeach and implore now the, the power of the Holy Spirit to preach your word to those who come to not only hear your word, but to do it as well. That together we might all receive the fruit of your word. Thank you for your word, O oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we do pray. Amen. As we get started today, I want to open this sermon with some good news and some bad news. Let me start with the bad news. And what I share is not shocking to anyone who's grown and mature. The bad news is this, is that life is filled with problems. As a matter of fact, if you're over 21, if you've been an adult for a season of life, you can insert an amen right there because you know my father, Alvin John Wesley, was right in one of his most beloved sermons where he simply said, if it's not one thing, it's another. It's not your car, it's your co-workers. It's not your health, it's your house. It's not your family, it's your finances or your friends. If it's not one thing, it is another. And if I can add to that, no matter how anointed you claim to be, there's no a level of holiness or righteousness that grants you immunity from the recurring problems that affect each and every one of us. If you gave your life to the Lord thinking that somehow that would excuse you from going through the storms we all inevitably go through, you are highly mistaken. Don't care how many scriptures you memorize, how long your prayers are, how many tongues you talk in. The word of God teaches us in the words of David in Psalm 34 that many are the afflictions of the righteous. It was Job who said that our days are few and full of trouble. And it was Jesus who reminded us in John 16 that in this world, you will have tribulation because life is filled with problems, afflictions, troubles, and tribulations. That's the bad news. But here's the good news, my sister. Here's the good news, my brother. The good news is that no matter what your troubles may be, no matter what tribulation you're facing, no matter what affliction you're going through, you never have to handle them all by yourself. For here is a truthful reality that when you signed up with Jesus, when you opened your heart to the grace of God, when you said yes to salvation by faith, you connected yourself to a God who loves to handle everything that's trying to handle you. I come by to tell you today that we serve a God who delights in fighting your battles and working things out for your good. We serve a God who enjoys preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. We serve a God who takes pride in taking that which was meant for your evil and using it to bless you. We serve a God who rejoices in thwarting the plans of the evildoers and the workers of iniquity. 
that God is gratified when he gets to be your shield and the lifter of your head, that in a real sense, we serve a God who loves it when we allow him to fight our battles. God will fight for you. And that's all I'm trying to share with you over these few weeks in this series, The Battle Is Not Yours, is that we serve a God who, if you would commit to his commandments, if you would follow his tactics, if you would obey his strategies, you will find out that as a disciple, you can literally live a life where you stand still and you watch the salvation of the Lord. That is the lesson of the history of the children of Israel that they have to learn time and time and time again. That they are learning to trust in a God who says whenever you are facing what you cannot handle, whenever you've got enemies on every side, whenever you've got a storm you did not prepare for, trust that I will fight on your behalf. When they're standing at the Red Sea in Exodus 14, Moses tells the children of Israel, stand still. You ain't even got to fight in this thing. When Israel is faced with the coming of the Babylonians, the prophet Isaiah declares unto them, don't worry. God is with you and God will strengthen you and God will fight for you. And who among us can never forget the words of Jehoshaphat? who tells the children of Israel when they are outnumbered. He says, stand still. The Lord will fight for you today. And all you've got to do is watch, sit down, grab your popcorn, kick your legs up and watch how God will handle your battles. And if somebody watching this sermon today, you know that to be true in your own testimony, in your own life, that you have seen time and time again how God is able to handle that which is trying to handle you. Children of Israel learned that lesson as they stand in front of the walls of Jericho. And we learned last week that if, if you would show up, if you would learn the discipline of silence, if you would learn to be persistent in your obedience, and when you learn to praise God on a promise, God will bring walls down right in front of your eyes. Well, the Israelites will learn that lesson again in the book of Judges. In chapter 7, as they prepare to face the Midianites and the Amalekites who are coming against them under the leadership of Gideon. And it is here that they will learn that not only will God fight your battle, but when God is on your side, all you need are a few good people. Come on, hear the reading of the word of the Lord from Judges chapter 7. I want to begin in verse number 1. Listen for the word of the Lord as I read out the New International Version of God's holy word. The Bible records these events. Early in the morning, Jerubbaal, also known as Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me, they will say. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remain. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water and there the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. 
The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. Let, let me talk to you today about a few good people. A few good people. Like last week, when we examined Joshua and Jericho, the events around Gideon and the Midianites are well known to many of us who've been raised in church. If you passed Sunday School 101, you've heard about Gideon and you know about these Midianites. The story is recorded in the book of Judges and quite honestly, Judges is one of the most boring books in all the Bible. Why do I say that? Because Judges is the same story told over and over and over and over again. The names may change. The context may be different. But the storyline is always the same in the book of Judges. And the story goes a little bit like this. The children of Israel sin and fall away from God. As a result, God allows an enemy to come into the land. After a period of time, the children of Israel cry out for deliverance. God raises up a judge to fight on their behalf. They're delivered from the hand of the enemy. They repent of their sin. They're cool for a little while, and then they fall away from God. God allows an enemy to come in. They cry out for deliverance. God raises up a judge. They're delivered and they repent. They're cool for a little while. And then they stray from God again. And God allows an enemy to come in. And they cry out for deliverance. And God raises up a judge. And they repent. And they're cool for a little while. And then the story starts over and over and over again. By the time we get to Judges chapter 6, this story is going down for the fourth time. For you see, after Deborah, the judge, has reigned, the children of Israel have been faithful to God for a season. But sure enough, they stray, they sin, they fall from the Lord. And as a result, God loosens his protective hand over Israel and allows the Midianites partnered with the Amalekites to now come into Israel and begin tormenting the Israelites. And here's the way it went down. The Israelites would plant their seed in the fall. And when harvest time would come, the Midianites and the Amalekites would come into the land and steal the harvest. They would steal the harvest that was planted by the Israelites, leaving the Israelites hungry and hiding out in the caves. And they cry out to God, God, you got to stop this. The Midianites are coming in and they're taking all of our food. God hears their cry and God decides to fight the battle with the Midianites. And he does it by raising up a military leader, the son of Joash, named Jerubal. But we better know him as Gideon. Gideon is called and commissioned to be the leader of the Israelites. The problem is that Gideon does not have a military resume. There's nothing on Gideon's resume that says soldier. As a matter of fact, when God finds Gideon and wants to call him, Gideon is so afraid of the Midianites, the Bible teaches us, that he's thrashing wheat in the wine press. Let me make certain you catch this. He's so afraid, he's thrashing wheat in the wine press. Terry, if you didn't know it, you don't thrash wheat in the wine press. Gideon is hiding out from the Midianites because he's afraid. And so here comes God with a calling and an assignment on Gideon's life finds him afraid in the wine press, and God looks at him 
and says, mighty man of valor, God is with you. Paul, stop, rewind, you missed it. He's afraid. He's thrashing wheat in the wine press. He's hiding out in the wine press and God shows up and calls him mighty man of valor. Okay, you still miss it, you a little slow. He's afraid and he's hiding out in the wine press and God shows up and calls him mighty man of valor. I'm so glad that when God sees us, God does not limit us to where we are, but God identifies us based on what God knows we can be. Somebody, you ought to type an amen right there because I want you to know that where you are will never determine who you are. That where you find yourself, what you've been going through, the context of your life, never places the limit on God's call of who you can be. And for somebody today, God's word to you is that my calling on your life is greater than any place you've ever been. I know you're in the wrong place. I know you're afraid. I know you're hiding out. I know you wish this didn't come your way. But when God sees you, when God calls you, when God identifies you, it's more than you've ever been. Get in you mighty man of valor, God is with you. And God is calling you to lead Israel in battle against the Midianites, but God is with you. And God's gonna fight this battle. After a little going back and forth, Gideon accepts the calling. And then Mel, he does what any of us would have done. He goes out to recruit an army. He does the math. The Midianites have about 120,000 soldiers. So in Gideon's mind, I need as many soldiers as we can find. He goes out, he goes out recruiting, goes out enlisting. And by the time we get to chapter seven, Gideon is now standing before the Lord. And watch this, he's got 32,000 soldiers right by his side. So imagine the scene, here is Gideon with 32,000 soldiers. And he says to God, now we're ready to go to battle. And listen at the word of the Lord. God comes back to Gideon and this is what he says. He says, Gideon, I cannot fight for you with all these men. Don't, don't miss this. God sees 32,000 men with Gideon and God says, you got to choose either them or me, but I cannot fight for you with 32,000 men. God says he can't do it. Now, now I don't want you to get this mistaken. When God says, I can't do it, it's not an issue of ability. There's nothing God can't do. No, it's a matter of desire. Then what God says to Gideon is, I choose not to fight for you if you're gonna take 32,000 men with you. It's not that I can't do it, it's that I choose not to do it. Beloved, that, that raises a very disturbing and difficult reality. And that reality is this, that God can choose not to fight for you. Can I push it? And the people you allow in your life play a role in whether or not God chooses to fight your battles. I don't know who needs to hear this, but the people in your world can readily affect how willing God is to step in and fight your battle for you. God can choose to let you handle it by yourself. And the people who are around you play a role in whether God decides to fight for you or not. This is what God tells Gideon, listen, listen, I can handle this, but I won't do it while you've got 32,000 people by your side. 
And so God is about to teach Gideon a valuable lesson. He's going to reduce Gideon's army from 32,000 to 300. And what he wants Gideon to learn is that some people's presence in your life is counterproductive to the plan of God. Let me say that again. Some people's presence in your life is counterproductive to the plan of God for your life. I'm going to say it one more again. Some people's presence in your life can be counterproductive to God's plan for your life. And what God wants Gideon to learn is that when I'm on your side and when I'm in your life and when you've turned it over to me, all you need are a few good people. Somebody, I came by to free you today because you've been addicted to having too many folk in your life. And I don't know who this is for. You don't need a blue check mark on your Instagram account. You don't need 100,000 followers on your Twitter account. You don't need to be Miss Popular or Mr. Popular on Facebook. You don't need to be surrounded by a crowd of friends. As a matter of fact, the more mature you become, the more you begin to realize that as long as the Lord is in my life, as long as God's hand is on me, as long as God is working on my side, all you really need are a few good people. Watch what God does with Gideon in reducing them. Gideon goes out and he recruits 32,000 men, watch this, Ashley, that look like soldiers. They got the soldier look down. And by the naked eye, they seem to be ready for battle. They know how to put on their armor. They know how to carry a sword. Some of them know how to mount a horse. They know how to march in a regimented line. By all appearances, these 32,000 men are soldiers. And so here come Gideon stepping up in the presence of God with 32,000 men that look like soldiers. And he says to God, I'm ready to go. I got 32,000 soldiers. God's word back to him is, no, you don't. G Gideon, you don't have 32,000 soldiers. You got 32,000 people because you've got some people in that crowd who have fooled you by the way they look. They have fooled you by the way they talk. They have fooled you by the way they live. They have fooled you into thinking that they are something they are not. And God says, here's the problem, Gideon. You chose them based on how they look, but I choose them based on what I know is in their heart. And I'm here to tell you that everybody in your crowd, everybody in your circle, everybody you signed up for is not really equipped for the battle that's about to go down. And you've been hoodwinked by what you saw. You've been fooled by the game they spit. You were led astray and deceived by their manipulation. And God says, but I'm looking inside their heart and I'm telling you that all of them ain't fit for this battle. Beloved, here's a lesson I came to drop on you, that we may be fooled by appearance. We may be, be deceived by speech. We may be misled by behavior, but God can never be fooled. God, you can't fool God. You might fool me, you might fool her, but you will never fool God. Wish I had a Bible reader here. The Bible says that God sends Samuel to go find the next king of Israel when God is fed up with Saul. And Samuel shows up and calls out the oldest son, Eliab. And when Eliab comes out, Samuel thinks that's the one, and God says to him this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. He said, listen, you're looking at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And people may fool you with their outward appearance, 
but they will never fool God with their heart. And so God says, Gideon, here it is, and this is going to be tough for you. But since you've been fooled, since you've been tricked, since you've been lied to and you can't see it, God is going to let something go down in Gideon's life that only has one purpose, to reveal the true nature of the people Gideon is dealing with. Don't you miss this. When God knows that we are surrounded by those who have fooled us with their appearance, but God sees something different in their heart, God will orchestrate a painful situation in your life that the only purpose it serves is to reveal the true nature and character of the people you are dealing with because God knows you've been deceived. Don't preach, Pastor. So God said, listen, listen, you thought she was your friend. You thought he had your back. You thought they loved you. So I'm going to let something go down in your life and it's not going to tickle you. You're not going to like it. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it's going to show you the true nature of the people you're dealing with because your eyes are wide shut and I need you to see they are not who they proclaim to be. Have, 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 have you ever gone through a painful situation only to look back over it a few seasons later and see that God was revealing to you something you could not see while your nose was wide open, why you were desperate, why you were thirsty, why you were head over heels in love, and God showed you the true nature of the people around you. I, I don't know who I'm preaching to right now, but I'm looking for somebody that can quote the gospel of Beyonce, Giselle, Knowles Carter, uh-huh, uh, the Queen B. Queen B's got some gospel out there. Queen B has a gospel song, and it goes a little something like this. So when I think of the time that I almost loved you, and then you showed yourself, and I saw the real you, thank God you blew it. Thank God I dodged the bullet. I'm so over you, so baby, good looking out. I wanted you bad, but I'm so through with that. Because you turned out to be the best thing I never had. Beyonce sang in that gospel song that every now and then you got to look back and thank God that he showed you their real nature. Thank God he took their mask off. Thank God he revealed what was in their heart. Thank God he let you go through it so you wouldn't go through it again. Is there anybody watching today who can look back at that season when God revealed the real nature of who you were dealing with and now you can thank God that they blew it? Thank God you dodged the bullet. Thank God he showed you who you were dealing with. Watch it, watch it, watch it. God says, Gideon, you've been hoodwinked. Let me prove it to you. Ask them who's afraid. Gideon turns back to 32,000 men. He said, hey, God told me to tell you how many of y'all are afraid. And the Bible says 22,000 of them raised their hand and said, we're afraid. And God said, listen, I've been trying to tell you something, Gideon. You thought they were soldiers, but 22,000 of them are afraid. And because they are afraid, they cannot go to battle with you. Now, 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 now hear me. The issue is not so much that they were afraid. That's not the greatest sin. Why does God dismiss 22,000 people who are afraid? Well, that's what you got to read your Bible. Because there's a law Moses put in place in Deuteronomy chapter 20. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 and in verse 8, Israel was commanded that whenever you form an army, the commander needs to ask who's afraid and send everyone who's afraid home. Why? Because those who are afraid will spread their fear among those who are ready to fight. And so the issue is not so much that they're afraid. 
The issue is the impact they can have on those who are faithful and ready to go to battle. And so the law says this, you can't take scared folk in the battle because scared folk make more scared folk. So send them home. What God is dealing with is a bigger problem. Because remember, Gideon, when God met him, was afraid. And God has been trying to build Gideon's faith. And now Gideon has surrounded himself with 22,000 men who will do nothing other than fertilize his fear. And God says to Gideon, the problem (laughs) is not the size of your army. The problem is the size of your faith. The issue is not how big your army is. The issue is how little your faith is. Y'all, I don't know who I came to preach to today, but God sent me on assignment to let you know that the issue for you is not the battle that's in front of you. The issue is not the diagnosis of the doctor. The issue is not the storm you're about to go through. The issue is how little your faith is in God. God says, I fight for folk who declare and demonstrate that they have faith in me, that they believe in me, that they trust in me, that if you want God to fight for you, you've got to show God the faith you have. Your level of faith is critical to God's level of fight. Go and say that again, pastor. Your level of faith is critical to God's level of fight. That my faith determines how God is gonna fight for me. I wish I had a Bible reader. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's so critical that we walk by faith and not by sight. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's Hebrews 11. If you don't have faith, you can't please God. If you're too scared, you can't please God. So God says, I need you surrounded by people who remind you that God is able. Gideon, you don't need any more agnostics. You don't need no more pessimistic folk. You don't need any more doubters around you. You don't need any more unbelievers in your circle. Gideon, what you need are people around you who remind you every day God is able. You need folk who see your struggle and say, girl, don't you give up on God right here. You need someone who sees your battle, brother. And reminds you, if you trust in the Lord, God will make a way. You need some faith-filled folk all around your life. Getting your problem is you have too many unbelievers around you. And that's why they've got to go, I can't fight for folk that ain't got no faith. Y'all, that, that's, that's, that's why you need to belong to a church. Because you need some people around you who remind you God is able. You need some people who every time you see them, they're cheering for God to make a way. You need some folk who remind you that if you pray, God will answer. You need some folk in your life who stand up and declare that God will fight your battles. You need folk who remind you every day that God is a way maker. God is a battle fighter. God is a door opener. God is a healer. You need some folk around you. We have faith in God. God says, Gideon, no, no, that, that, them folk, they don't have enough faith. And their lack of faith will cause you to lose faith. And your level of faith determines my level of fight. So they got to go. But, 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 but God ain't done. No, no, 22,000 leave. They're left with 10,000. God comes back to Gideon again. Still too many, too many folk. So God says, Gideon, let me do you a favor. 
Let me thin out the crowd. Did you know that God ha has, has a tendency to thin out your crowd? This is what God says, listen, Gideon, I'm going to thin the crowd out for you. This is what I want you to do. Take them down to the water. Let, let's have a water test. And here's the way the water test is going to go. God says, I'm going to take you down to the water. They're going to want to drink. And I want you to pay attention on how they drink water. Here it is. Here's your test. Take them down to the water and watch how they drink. He said, listen, it's going to go down two ways. Some of them are going to see the water. They're going to put their face in the water and start drinking. He says, and some of them are going to take water in their hand and scoop it up and lick it out of their hands. God says, watch the water, Gideon. It's going to tell you something. Some of them are going to drink from the water and some of them are going to pull the water to their mouth. And God says, whoever puts their face in the water can't go to battle with you. I can't fight with folk that put their face in the water. Gideon takes him down to the water. And what God said happens. Bible says 9,700 people put their face in the water. 300 took the water in their hand and brought it up to their mouths. Don't miss this. 9,700 are down at the water drinking from the water. 300 are bringing the water to their mouths. And God says to Gideon, you got to get rid of the 9,700 that are drinking water from the, from the lake and only take the 300 that are pulling it to their mouths. Now, 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 you ought to be asking the question right here. Why come God gets rid of anybody who puts their face in the water? Why does God tell Gideon the folk who put their face in the water cannot go with you? I can't fight with people that put their face in the water. Two problems. When they got down to the water, 9,700 of them were so consumed by their own thirst that they got down and put their face in the water. And when they put their face in the water, they lost their ability to see what was coming down the road. Don't miss this, there's a battle. The Midianites are coming and they got down to the water and the only thing they thought about was what they wanted to drink right here and right now. And so rather than keeping an eye open for what's coming, they only consume themselves with what is right here and right now. And God says part of the problem is I can't fight for folk who don't have any vision. Those who limit life to what's right in front of them. Those who are so consumed with their own thirst that they're not looking for anything down the road. They live in an eternal present without any vision for it tomorrow. God says, I can't fight for folk that can't see past right here. There's more than today. There's more than this situation. There's more than this body of water. There's more than this thirst. There's more than this anger. There's more to your life than right here and right now. Do you have vision for something more? Can I push it? Not only have they lost vision, but let me suggest to you, Angie, God gets rid of them because they're selfish. Why do they put their face in the water? So that they can drink as much as they can. Because you see, when you cup water and pull it up, you cannot drink as much as those who have their face in the water. All they cared about 
was their own thirst. All they cared about was what they wanted. The 300 who pulled water up, they couldn't drink as much, but they could watch out over their brothers and sisters. Those who pulled water up may not have been as full as everyone else, but they were able to watch over the community. They were able to see what was happening. They were able to be responsible for their brothers and their sisters because they understood that no matter what, we are never in a position where all God has called us to do is take care of ourselves. So Lord says, those are the ones I want to fight with. That I want to fight with people who've got a vision for tomorrow and a concern for their neighbor. I want to fight with folk they can look at themselves and see their lives down the road and believe that God has more in store for them. I want to fight for folk who don't live by carpe diem, seize the day, but who believe that God has destined me to do more than just today. I fight for folk that want to make a generational impact. I fight for folk that want to leave legacy on the earth. I fight for folk who want to do something today that opens the door for the unborn tomorrow. I want to fight for folk who care about more than their own thirst. God doesn't fight for you just to make a way for you right now so you can go get a new degree and get you a new title and put some more money in your bank and go get you a new car and you live in a new house and move out to a fancy suburb. God says, that's not why I fight for you. I fight for you so that you can make an impact in tomorrow. I fight for you so you can touch some young girl tomorrow. I fight for you so you can open a door for a brother tomorrow. I'm fighting for you to make a difference in somebody else's life. Gideon all, you can't take them because they're afraid and they're going to affect your faith. You can't take them because they don't have vision and all they care about is their own thirst. Here's the last thing God says, Gideon, the reason I'm getting rid of all these people is because I have to protect my praise. It's, it's going to get quiet here and someone's going to shut off. But God told Gideon in the beginning, he said, listen, the reason I can't let you go with 32,000, I know y'all. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to bring you through. You're going to get on the other side of victory over the Midianites. You're going to kick your legs up. You're going to pat yourself on the back. And you're going to say, look what we done did. Because God knows it's human nature for us to convince ourselves we made it by ourselves. God says, I know there's some of you who say, look what we did. Somebody watching today, you believe you made it happen. Some of us believe we've earned it. Some of us convince ourselves we deserve it. Some of us believe we saw ourselves through it, that we navigated the path that we planned our success, that we worked hard for it, that we quieted the opposition, that we handled it. And if by chance you're watching today and you really believe that you've earned where you are, if you believe that you are where you are because you navigated the potholes of life, if you believe that you're alive because you fought off all the things that tried to kill you, if you think you made it by yourself, do me a favor, go and shut this sermon off right now because the rest of this sermon ain't gonna do nothing other than anger you because you are a self-made woman. You are a self-made man. I'm not preaching for the folk that think they're self-made. God got rid of them. God says, I'm looking for folk who when they get on the other side, they know it had not been for the Lord. Someone that can wake up every morning and declare, God's hand brought me where I am. 
Somebody who humbles themselves and declares the Lord made a way out of no way. Is there anybody watching today who knows God opened that door? God kept me in that storm. God made a way for me. God preserved my life. God kept my children. God blessed me with resources. God kept me through everything that could have destroyed me. It was the Lord. So God's trying to teach Gideon, I can't take anybody who I already know is going to get on the other side and not know how to praise me. Can I tell you who God fights for? God fights for those who've got faith. God fights for those who have vision. God fights for those who care about others. And God fights for those who've already proven they know how to praise his name. How does God know I can give him glory? Because I've done it before. How does God know I won't take credit myself because he saw what I did last time? Every time I praise God, I'm not just thanking God for what he did. I'm proving to God he can do it again. God, you can trust me to give you glory. You can trust me to honor you. You can trust me to lift up hands. You can trust me to say amen. You can trust me to give you thanksgiving because I've done it before. God says, Gideon, that's who I fight for. Folk with a proven track record of praising me. That's why I praise the Lord. Because every time I praise God, I'm sowing a seed for God to fight my next battle. Here's what God says. If you want me to give you victory, you've got to give me glory. Th th there it is. If you want God to give you victory, you've got to unashamedly Learn to give God glory. God says to Gideon, listen, you want the victory, but I want the glory. And so here's what I'm going to do, Gideon. I'm going to take away almost everyone you chose to make certain that when victory comes, you give me glory. Don't miss how this goes down. God says, I'm going to take from you so that you must give to me. Don't, don't miss this. I, I, I'm, I'm going to put you in a situation where it looks like there's no way you can win so that when you come out, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it had to be God. Get in. I'm going to reduce your resources so you know it had to be God. I'm going to let the odds fall out of your favor so you know it had to be God. I'm going to let the doctor say we found something so you know it had to be God. I'm going to let the medication not work so you know when you're healed it had to be God. I'm going to let the recruiter say they found a better candidate so when you get the better job you know it had to be God. I'm going to let Boo Boo say bye-bye so when you make it without him, you know it had to be God. I'm going to set the stage for my glory. I don't know who I came to preach to today, but this is the last point of the sermon, that when things start to shift, when they look like they're going from bad to worse, when the statistics are against you, when the prognosis ain't good, when the odds are not in your favor, when it seems like it's getting worse, don't be discouraged. God is simply setting the stage for his glory. God says, I do this so that when I bring you through and when I make a way and when I answer prayer and when I heal, you know that you know that you know that you know it had to be God. Uh, let me help someone. I'm, I'm going to leave you now. 
I remember the very first time my parents took me to see a theater play. I remember I was in eighth grade and my father, who was a fan of August Wilson, the playwright, took me to see Fences. He took me to see Fences, part of August Wilson's Pittsburgh cycle, 10 plays that chronicle the lives of African-Americans, must see. And in eighth grade, my father took me to see Fences. And part of the reason he took me to see Fences is that the lead actor who played Troy Maxson in Fences was being played by James Earl Jones. And my dad knew how much I love James Earl Jones. Why do I love James Earl Jones so much? Because I'm a Star Wars child. And James Earl Jones is the voice of Darth Vader. And ever since I saw Star Wars, I was in love with the voice of James Earl Jones. And now my dad is taking me to a theater to see Fences so I can see James Earl Jones with my own eyes. Y'all, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in eighth grade, it was 1986, and we were in the third row watching Fences at the Chicago Theater so I could see James Earl Jones. It's my first time at a theater play. When we got down in the third row to see Fences in 1986 with James Earl Jones, I was as excited as excited could be. I could hardly sit down because I'm about to lay eyes on the voice of Darth Vader and see James Earl Jones. I am excited in the theater. A little while after we were there, the lights began to blink. And then every few minutes, it got darker and darker and darker until the point where the theater was dark midnight black. Everyone sat down. Then all of a sudden, the curtain opened, the lights came on, and there was James Earl Jones sitting on stage, and everyone in the theater began to clap. I wanna make certain you see how it happened. When the lights are on, we're all jumping and excited, and sooner or later, the lights began to darken. It got dim, it got dark, and it got black. It got so dark, everyone sat down and was quiet. And in the middle of the darkness, all of a sudden the curtain opens, the spotlight comes, and the star is standing in the middle of the stage. And I learned a very valuable life lesson that night, and that is this, that when it gets dark, that just means the star is about to come out. When it gets dark and you can't see and you wonder what's about to happen, the stage is being set for the star to shine. Don't get discouraged when it gets dark, but get excited knowing God's about to start. God's about to move. God's about to answer. God's about to make a way. The door's about to open. The light's about to shine. God's about to be seen in the midst of your darkness. God is about to show up. Somebody, I want you to know he will fight your battles. But you can't have everyone around you. He will fight your battles. But you need people of faith in your life. He will fight your battle. But you have to have a vision for your life that is bigger than yourself. He will fight your battle, but you've got to prove that you know how to praise him. Thank him now for what he's already done. And when it gets dark, know that God is on his way. God, I'm grateful that you fight battles. I'm grateful, Lord, that you handle enemy. I'm grateful that when it looks like it's at its worst, you're about to be at your best. Encourage my brother, speak to my sister now and remind them, O oh Lord, the battle is not yours. This is our prayer and we ask it in Jesus name, amen. Beloved, I hope and pray the word of God, edified, encouraged, instructed, calls you to have more faith and belief 
that God will fight your battles. Listen, next week we're gonna pause the series. Next week we're celebrating 14 years of pastor and people that God has joined together here at Alpha Street Baptist Church. And I am proud, pleased to welcome my brother from another mother. We go way back to the streets of the South Side of Chicago, the Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby, the pastor of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, will be with us next weekend online and live as we celebrate these 14 years of what the Lord has done. If you're watching today, you wanna know more about God's love for you, God's salvation for your life, how God died on the cross to prove how valuable you are to God, and you wanna open your heart to that love, do me a favor, go out on our website, fill out that membership form, you give us a little information about you, we'll reach out to you even today to share with you God's amazing plan of salvation. If you also are interested in being part of this church family, you don't have to live in driving distance, Wherever you are in the World Wide Web, there's space for you to be in relationship with us here at Alfred Street Baptist Church. Fill out that same membership form and give us the privilege of being in relationship with you. Pastor Wesley, I love you with the love of Jesus Christ. I thank the Lord for the word today, for worship, and for 14 years of serving in this place. Come on, let's look to the Lord for our benediction. And now, and to the Almighty, the All-Wise, the Eternal, the Sovereign, the omnipotent God, who alone is creator of heaven and earth, to the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who alone is our Christ. He is our loving Lord, our sacrificial savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning redeemer. To the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity and the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return said amen.